The Safe Airway Society, or SAS, is the INS professional airway society for Australia and New Zealand. Our members come from a wide variety of health professions. From the outset we've tried to include everybody that's involved in airway management, but we also represent patients and their families. And we feel like that makes us unique amongst airway societies worldwide. There are three main reasons why SAS has been created. Um, and in three words, that's connection, collaboration and patient safety. So in terms of connection, uh, we recognise that within and across Australia and New Zealand, we have some quite unique uh, geographical challenges of distance and environment. What we aim to do and achieve is to connect people from all corners of Australia and New Zealand. Which leads us to the next reason being collaboration, and that's a collaboration of professions. A collaboration of skills, knowledge and expertise, uh, collaboration and research and education. And that kind of takes us to the main reason being patient safety. So we're there primarily to promote airway management and safe practices in airway management, regardless of your profession or where you work. Historically, airway management was really the remit of the anaesthetist, but contemporary medicine Airway management is occurring all over the hospital and pre hospitally so critical care clinicians, range bank patients in the intensive care unit, emergency physicians in the emergency department, and then either pre-hospital clinicians or paramedics in the pre-hospital environments. The concept of SAS is really the idea of cross-pollination and bringing the expertise from all those different interprofessional groups to promote best airway practice in all the settings that it can occur. Overall, airway management is very safe and effective. However, there are still incidents now where patients can get seriously injured or even die. What we want to do is create an environment where safe and effective airway management is delivered to all patients. The way we're hoping to, to do that is to create better resources, to improve the existing systems that we've got already, and also through education and research. So we want to look at how we work as humans, as well as how we work together as a team. A complex healthcare challenge needs an interprofessional collaborative approach. Join us at safeairwaysociety.org. Welcome back. Well, welcome back everyone. In this segment, we're in the ICU and we're starting to think about extubation of our patient. Uh, at this point, I'm delighted to welcome to the panel, Elliot Williams, who is a nurse practitioner in ICU at Royal North Shore in Sydney. For those unfamiliar with the Australian nurse designations, nurse practitioner is kind of the elite special forces of the nursing ranks. In this session, our OR team ponders how best to extubate this patient um, and our panel will explore how we identify which patients are at risk during extubation, whether extubation needs the same careful attention to detail that we applied to the securing the airway start of the, start of the journey. We want to know what existing guidelines can provide us with and what else is missing from existing guidelines. And finally, what equipment and techniques can we use to aid us during extubation? So I'm going to come to you first, Louise. You've given this a lot of thought, particularly recently with your work for the Project for Universal Airway Management. Before we get too far down this rabbit hole of what is extubation, tell us or define for us what is meant by an at-risk airway for extubation. Um, yeah, thanks, Adam. So look, an at-risk airway um, you could define as actual or anticipated difficulty due to anatomical reasons. Um, but also in taking into account various situational factors, things like available personnel, equipment, location, time of day um, that contribute to risk uh, and also physiological risk. So a, a patient with respiratory or neuromuscular conditions. So if you're applying those conditions to extubation, um, I guess I'd ask myself, do I anticipate that reintubation will be difficult um, if it becomes necessary? And you might base that assessment on whether the patient uh, was difficult when they were intubated or whether something has changed since they were intubated. Um, or is the patient at risk of failing to tolerate removal of that airway support, therefore increasing the risk that they will need to be reintubated? And I think the most at risk 
is the patient who is both at risk of requiring reintubation and we anticipate that that reintubation may be difficult. Fantastic. Now I'll bring up on the screen here one of the uh, well, part of one of the existing guidelines for extubation. This is the DAS guideline uh, for extubation. The other great guideline that's out there is the All India um, guidelines for extubation, which Sheila was a co-author of. But I want to bring the attention here to these are for the at-risk patients, and it sort of brings us down to do we uh, uh, extubate them awake? Do we extubate them with an advanced technique? Do we postpone extubation? or do we perform a tracheostomy? And all too often I see patients being sent up to ICU just because they were difficult at the start. And I don't really think there's been a lot of thought gone into why we're sending them up to extubation. So what are your thoughts about that, Lloyd? Yeah, look, I think that's a great question, Adam. And I think the shorter answer is far too often the default position for managing an at-risk extubation is to, um, to keep the patient intubated and send them, send them to ICU. And I'd, I'd really encourage you, if that's your chosen, chosen strategy, just consider, are you making it someone else's problem on another day? Uh, and especially if you're an anaesthetist, are you making it someone else's problem in a location outside of theatres, maybe at a time when resources are more limited? Um, it, and is that in the patient's best interest? It, look, it might be. Um, there are certainly valid reasons why you might choose to keep the patient um, intubated. There might be non-airway reasons, you know, like they might have a metabolic state or a neurological state that means that they're not ready to be extubated. You might have airway issues that you expect will improve with the passage of time, resolution of edema um, or resolution of infection. Or there might be situational factors that will also improve with the passage of time. It might be the middle of the night and that might be a terrible time to extubate the patient. Um, but if none of those things are true and you don't expect improvement, then arguably the theatre setting uh, is the safest place to extubate a patient with an at-risk airway if you combine that with strategies to minimise uh, the risk and strategies to re-intubate if that becomes necessary. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to come to you now, Sheila. You, you've been a co-author on a, on a really big case series or a, a study, in fact, um, looking at uh, head and neck cases and the factors that would determine who should be given a tracheostomy early and who gets a trial of extubation in a couple of days. How do you decide if they're ready and safe to extubate? Uh, thank you for this question. I think this is very important and uh, Laura has uh, covered a lot of the points that I wanted to uh, mention. Now, before you extubate this patient, and he's day three in the ICU now, uh, you have to think about, is the timing correct? Where are you going to extubate the patient and how are you going to extubate the patient? This is extremely important. Now, it's also important to distinguish between just, um, you know, uh, difficult uh, at-risk extubation and weaning failure. So once you have a patient in an ICU for three days, you have to really ask that why was this patient not extubated earlier? So was it because there was some aspiration? Was it because of laryngeal edema? Was it because of some other uh, anatomical or physiological factors? So before extubating this patient, we have to ensure that these factors have uh, been taken care of. Uh, and reversed. Otherwise, your extubation is going to fail. So a lot of time as anesthetists and upper airway operators, we only think about uh, the failure of extubation, but it could be a weaning failure. It could be a weaning failure because of some respiratory condition. It could be because of some neuromuscular weakness. It could be because of a weaning failure of cardiac origin, whatever the condition is. So I think this is, this is extremely important when a patient is in ICU. This is not the same as extubating a patient following a surgery uh, in the operating room. So definitely, I would uh, you know uh, adjust the timing based on these considerations. I would also like to take the this is a, a at risk uh, extubation as Laura has already um, alluded to. I would like to take this patient to the operating room, more controlled environment, just in case I need to reintubate the uh, the patient, and I would do it under bronchoscopic uh, guidance rather than just use an airway exchange uh, catheter. And as I mentioned in my talk, very important two questions. Uh, you know, is this, uh, was this, is this an at-risk extubation and the second is going to be difficult? If the answer to both these questions is yes, then I would be extremely cautious and keep everything ready for a reintubation, including my dream. And most importantly, throughout the extubation procedure, 
you know, keep the patient uh, uh, oxygenated and have a backup plan for a tracheostomy. So this decision for a tracheostomy, of course, would be one that you have to plan with your surgeon. If you think whatever reason you've kept the tube for, the condition has not been reversed or the upper airway is still compromised, you may also have to be ready to perform a tracheostomy if this fails. Fantastic. And thinking more generally about uh, patients, uh, at-risk patients in the ICU, what are some of the tests you do to determine when a patient is safe or fit for, for extubation? versus, uh, you know, leaving them intubated or changing to tracheostomy? What sort of leak tests or other things do you do tonight? Uh, so a leak test has a lot of false positive and negative results. Nevertheless, it gives you some uh, kind of assessment of whether you could, uh, you know, extubate this patient safely. And there's, so it's done for laryngeal edema. And this is especially important when you have a tube in for more than 24 hours. So you can deflate the cuff and you can look for any audible or put a stethoscope uh, on the neck, or you can even look at the loss of uh, volume uh, on the, when the patient is being mechanically ventilated. So this is what you can look at. But remember, it, it's not a 100% test. But mm -hmm. if you are, are still in doubt, you can uh, extubate the patient over a tube exchanger uh, and keep the tube exchanger in and then extubate the patient just in case it's a difficult intubation and you may need to reintubate. Uh, this patient. But always remember that if there is laryngeal edema, you're likely to require a smaller size tube uh, when you reintubate the patient. You may not be able to put back the same uh, size tube. So I would definitely do a leak test in these uh, patients, though it's not 100%. You have to be prepared uh, to have a patient with uh, laryngeal edema going into strider and not being able to maintain a patent airway despite the patient having a leak. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, Elliot, I want to come to you now. You would have seen more than your share of extubations in the intensive care department. Some, many will have gone well and some that probably haven't gone to gone as planned. Have you picked up any common features or lessons that you can identify on uh, what predicts good or, good or bad performance of, during these extubations? I think you're on mute there, Elliot. There we go. Now Sorry. you're right, you're good. So um, go. Yeah, look, I, I think um, quite often, as is the case, I suspect with many other sort of high risk things that happen in, you know, intensive care, operating theatres, emergency, uh, I think the features of when this is done well tend to focus around adequate planning, identification of risks, uh, and sort of that approach with a bit of a hands off leadership style for uh, the particularly high risk things. So, um, I suppose it, you know, in the context of extubation, it's thinking about making sure that uh, there, everybody who's going to be involved is is aware that there's potentially some risk that it isn't going to be straightforward, um, and that then, you know, building out from there is, uh, do you have the necessary sort of emergency equipment immediately available? Are there roles that have been allocated in the event that things don't go to plan? Um, and I think the other thing that's very useful, that's often a feature of uh, when things go wrong and the management of that uh, is done very well, is when there's been some specific planning or discussion around some of the highly anticipated uh, issues that you could potentially see. So beyond saying, you know, sort of in general terms, we have certain equipment available to reintubate, you know, very specifically stepping through with the team. Uh, you know, who will do what, uh, under what circumstances and making sure that uh, we, we don't sort of get ready to proceed until such time as everybody's sort of on the same page and there's a really, uh, really clear plan. And I think that's that's definitely, uh, you know, one of the, the important features of doing these uh, high risk things fairly well, fairly well, sorry. Yeah, fantastic. So you're really building on, a th on some themes that have been um, emphasised across the whole morning and afternoon, which is around having a shared mental model of what needs to happen, really elaborating a strategy with your whole team in detail, not just in vague term terms, and establishing the roles of who's going to do each of those stages of the strategy. So that's fantastic. Um, I, th I th just want to update you on our patient state at this point. So um, as Sheila, uh, the information that we'd given to Sheila was exactly as you're seeing on the um, the slide here, which is that um, our patient was intubated in the operating theatre, unfortunately with a very small size six MLT um, 
and uh, was then taken for uh, imaging where he was found to have a depressed fracture of his thyroid cartilage, which was repaired um, operatively with a plate across the thyroid cartilage. You can see that is the top picture in the middle there. Um, also during an examination under anesthesia, there was a small rupture um, repaired uh, in the glottis and you can see the stitch uh, in the immediate post-operative period and the tube still in situ. And where we are now is on day three, our patient who turned out to have fairly, fairly severe obstructive sleep apnea and was a heavy smoker is becoming quite tube intolerant and difficult to ventilate and um, is in getting increasingly difficult to suction down this small MLT. So we feel that he needs some extubation at this point. And we've heard some thoughts from Sheila around how she would go about uh, extubating this patient. And it's interesting that um, you, you've suggested, Sheila, using a fiber optic scope, almost like a tube exchange catheter. Explain how you would do that and what the advantage of a tube, an exchange catheter is, but or using a fiber optic scope, what, what either of these bring in terms of an advantage? He's had airway injury. I wouldn't use an airway exchange catheter. Where a flexible bronchoscope uh, scores above an airway exchange catheter is uh, you can uh, uh, extubate the patient, uh, you know, you can use the uh, bronchoscope like an airway exchange catheter as a conduit, but you can do it under vision. So uh, I would use a pediatric bronchoscope and I would like to examine uh, the airway and withdraw the uh, tube, deflate the cuff of the tube and withdraw the tube uh, and there's also been injury distal to the uh, cricothyroid membrane. So I would like to examine this. And if things look okay and re reasonably fine, I can go on withdrawing it and make sure that there's airway patency. If you see any dynamic airway collapse, you can just slide the tube back. So this avoids an extubation and a reintubation. We often do it when the uh, stability, there is, you know, the trachea is not very stable or any conditions where you're suspecting that there may be dynamic airway collapse. In addition, I just like to uh, say that this patient has been in the ICU for three days with this small size tube. So airway edema is also needs to be uh, treated. I would give a shot of steroids to this patient. And uh, I would also do a leak test prior to any of this. But I would have my surgeon ready to do a tracheostomy in case any of this uh, fails. And it is a challenge to ventilate a patient in the ICU with a size five tube. So if he needs further uh, ventilation, he's not ready for extubation or fails extubation, I think a tracheostomy would be a safer and a better plan for this patient. Okay, fantastic. And I'm assuming before you put the pediatric, um, uh, you, you put the pediatric scope through the tube, remove the tube over the pediatric scope so it can just be reinserted if needed. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I've got a question for you, John. Um, the extubation is not something that would be a typically practiced. Um, uh, procedure in the emergency department, but I'm guessing there may be times where you have patients that just need a, a scan or something similar and then have to be extubated. Is it, how do you approach it down there or, or do you ever have to do extubation in the emergency department? Uh, it's a pretty rare event for us to have to extubate someone in the emergency department. Um, although now with COVID and the crisis we're, we're facing in, in hospitals in the United States, there are some um, NICU patients that are intubated in the ED and require extubation before they ever gone up to the, the NICU. They've been down there two or three days and whatever pathophysiology was involved has resolved. So we'll, time, we'll sometimes extubate them in the ED. But these are low risk patients, like an overdose patient who's metabolized and is now mental status is good, or hypoxic respiratory failure from cardiogenic pulmonary edema that tunes up in a day or two and could be extubated. So uh, I would not classify these as high risk extubations. I did notice from uh, your presentation that on one of the videos, um, there was a patient with an exchange catheter in the airway. Um, so I'm assuming uh, the exchange catheters that are often used for extubation are not, uh, they're, they're a piece of equipment that's familiar to you. You may have to do tube exchanges in the ED. Pretty rare in the ED. The only time we'll typically do them is if uh, we recognize immediately there's a cuff leak if the cuff was damaged on intubation, and that's usually pretty obvious, but that's a pretty rare event. That's the only time I've done tube exchanges is when yep. there's an obvious uh, cuff leak. Right. So the tube exchange catheters that I'm referring to are 
reasonably bulky um, devices, often sort of 11, 14 French um, devices, and can be uh, a bit difficult for the patient to tolerate. More recently, um, there is, there's been released the cooked staged extubation set. Um, I'll bring that up on the screen. You can see that there. This is a, a, a device or a, a, a technique which allows essentially a wire um, slightly thicker than the typical central line wire um, to uh, be left in the airway, which then allows a two-stage reinsertion of a exchange catheter and a tube over the top of that. Um, I've had no um, experience with the cooked stage, stage extubation set. I'm wondering if any, um, whether Louise or Sheila have used this device or technique at all. You're nodding there, um, Louise. Yeah, look, Adam, I, I'll, I'll declare my, my bias here, and, and that is if, um, if I'm going to use an airway exchange catheter um, as a tool to help um, improve the safety of extubation and to re-intubate the patient, um, I would use a, a standard cook airway exchange catheter um, rather than the staged extubation set. And, and the rationale I have for that is that it's very easy to dislodge the wire when you're either reinserting the airway exchange catheter or the, the wire stiffener or the tube over the top. Um, I don't use an airway exchange catheter lightly. Um, they are associated with risk if you don't use them properly and you're not trained in their use but I will not hesitate to use an airway exchange catheter um, as a really important tool for an at-risk extubation. Um, so, you know, in, in this sort of patient that we're talking about here, um, you know, I probably slightly different to, to Sheila's approach, uh, instead of extubating um, over the, the bronchoscope, which um, although you can get some valuable information and may I, maybe I would do that, um, you know, prior to considering extubation, uh, I, I would instead use an airway exchange catheter and I would leave that in for as long as the risk of reintubation remains. And that could be 24 hours or even more. Um, and as long as it's used safely at an appropriate depth um, in a location that is used to using airway exchange catheters and it's clearly labelled and no supplemental oxygen is supplied to it, um, then I think this is an incredibly valuable and useful technique um, that although it is not 100% guaranteed that you can re-intubate over it, um, that Mort study from years ago now showed us that, that the first chance um, success of re-intubation was very good. As you said, we had a small endotracheal tube in this patient, so we would need to use a 14 French cooked airway exchange catheter rather than the 19 French that I'd normally use for an adult size tube. And just along I those lines... Oh, sorry, yes, did you want to say something? Add, uh, I've used both the sets. So, of course, you have to only use this if you anticipate that the reintubation may be difficult. But whether you use a guide wire stage set or you use the regular cook catheter, you have to secure the device well and you have to counsel the patient. And it helps to give nebulization using uh, local anesthetic nebulization. The patients tolerate this uh, very well. And as Laura has rightly said, the position of the tube is extremely important. Make sure it's not endobronchial. It shouldn't go beyond the marking of the endotracheal tube at the level of the incisor that was present and make sure you don't give any oxygen through this hollow device. If at all you want to supplement oxygen, it should go uh, using a face mask and not through this because you could have uh, dangerous uh, complications and no jet ventilation, definitely. So I love these tips for the kids at home. No jetting or putting oxygen down tube exchange catheters or narrow catheters. Um, just read the uh, the hearings of the Gordon Ewing case in Scotland to be scared of ever putting oxygen down um, narrow catheters again. Um, Nick, Just one, one more point, if I may, uh, yes. you know, to avoid, uh, increase the success rate if you need to reintubate, uh, it helps to supplement, you know, use a visual laryngoscope along with the, uh, you know, the um, uh, airway exchange catheter. So what we often do is you put the visual laryngoscope and make sure the tube is not getting uh, butting anywhere and going through smoothly. So you can combine another combined technique for you, Nick. That's, that's a great tip there, Sheila. And I think your tip around the nebulized lignocaine as well. Um, intraoperatively or in, in the operating theater, we often use remifentanil to blunt the airway reflexes, but it's a difficult and a fraught um, delivery to continue outside the operating theater. And I think using other 
topicalization techniques to improve uh, tolerance is, is, a, is a great tip there. Nick. So just a couple of quick questions because we're nearly out of time. So Alison Williams, who I think has stayed with us the whole day, so we've got to admire her stamina, has said she finds leaving an airway exchange catheter in you to be problematic. She suspects the uh, exchange catheter wasn't in the trachea. I'm not sure whether that means it was in a bronchus or in the, the pharynx, but she's asking the panel, any tips for successful use for an airway exchange catheter? Um, look, my, my two tips on that is um, a little bit like we were talking about before with using... Um, multiple personnel. I think it is a, 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 it's a, a challenging technique and it's something that you do need to practice um, and it's a two-person technique. So when you're putting the airway exchange catheter in, it's one person's job to make sure that that airway exchange catheter remains at exactly the same depth as the endotracheal tube and it's the other person's job to deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube and very slowly and really is it is, a, it is something that you need great communication with your anaesthetic assistant or the ICU nurse or whoever you're doing this technique with to say, you know, are we still at 23? Are we still at 23? Um, just as I was, um, I, I, had a, I had an experience relatively recently um, where I reassured everyone that the patient was going to tolerate the airway exchange catheter very well because it is my experience that they generally do. This patient didn't tolerate it well and sure enough, when we got an x-ray, um, the airway exchange catheter had migrated um, t towards the carina and, and, and I think that was what was causing... Um, the, the poor compliance. So um, make sure it's at the same depth as the endotracheal tube, secure it really well, and if it's going to stay in more than, you know, about an hour or so, which probably it should, I'd strongly suggest an x-ray to make sure it's mid-tracheal. Fantastic, Thanks. Louise. Uh, one, one, one last question. So David Vokes, uh, one of the SAS crew, an ENT surgeon in um, New Zealand. And has... can we just actually um, acknowledge the great work David's done in getting this meeting up and running? So he couldn't be with us today, but he's actually, we want to actually acknowledge David's work he's put in. So, sorry, Nick. Yep. Um, so he's asked, would anyone consider a formal sus suspension microlaryngoscopy and tracheoscopy by ENT to fully assess the airway um, with a view to deciding what to do for extubation? Uh, if I may take that question. Sure, Sheila. Uh, definitely, there is no question that this should be done following any airway surgery. There has to be a complete assessment. You have to be sure that the reason for which you're keeping this tube and uh, following the surgery, I mean, the surgeon would do this assessment. But this is very uh, important because if this, uh, you know, you have any concerns, then you may, you know, doing a tube exchange or putting in another tube uh, might actually worsen the situation and you may need to do uh, an elective uh, tracheostomy. So there has to be a careful planning because uh, remember, this is not an emergency situation. So you have to dis discuss with your team, including your surgeon, uh, as to what your plan is and what you're going to do if there is failure. I think this is uh, extremely important, the examination after the airway, following any trauma and following this nature of surgery. I have to confess that's not something, it's interesting to hear Sheila say, be so emphatic about that. It's, it's not something, I can see the value of it, but it wouldn't have necessarily crossed my mind. Louise, Adam, is that is that something that, that you would see regularly done prior to extubation? Um, look, I don't. I think it depends on the nature of the surgery and um, the extent of, uh, of intervention that's uh, done intraoperatively, or whether we're just considering the problem of edema. Um, but I think it goes back to the clear communication that the, the first that the surgeons hear about this extubation shouldn't be as they're rushing up to theatre because you've got a patient that's uh, occluding and needing an emergency surgical airway. You really want to road test this plan to extubate with your surgical team so that they're present, um, potentially even scrubbed if you're that worried about uh, this, similar to the double setup that um, we were referring to earlier. Um, if you're that worried about it, you may have the surgeons in the room and scrub. So it's a good lesson about sort of thinking outside routine practice and, and your bubble and, and making sure you, you really make use of, of all the, the, um, the modalities that are available to you assess the airway. We've got to take a, a short break in a moment. Adam, do you want to quickly wrap up uh, this session and then we'll, we'll go to an ad? Yeah, look, uh, um, I think we, we, what we've taken away from this session is that um, deciding who's at risk at extubation is a function of both the likelihood that they'll fail extubation and the expected difficulty of the re-intubation. Existing guidelines help us approach extubation with an appropriate plan and hopefully a strategy for re-intubation. 
again, clear communication of the strategy allows our teams to uh, pre uh, be prepared to implement the strategy and uh, we need some hands-off leadership, it's essential. What is lacking is guidance about when to defer, when to take the bull by the horns and when to go for a tracheostomy early. So we'll be back in just a moment.